Welcome to this Vulval Pain Society live expert webinar number five. Uh, so far in this free series, uh, we've covered vulval pain generally, uh, dermatology, including lichen sclerosis, lichen planus, physio, and calming the nervous system. If there are any of those that you haven't watched and you'd like access to them, please email us at info at vulvalpainsociety.org. Info at vulvalpainsociety.org. So today we've got yoga and meditation with Armana Bahaduri. Am I pronouncing Hasa. that correctly? Wonderful. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Brilliant. Now, Armana, I know that you are experienced in working with women with pelvic and vulval pain. Um, before we dive on into the questions, I've noticed you teach Hatha yoga, Hatha flow, yin, vinyasa, and meditation. What does it all mean? What's the differences between all these different types of yoga? And then what's the difference between yoga and meditation? Wonderful. Firstly, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, yeah, I'm really happy to be here. Um, so good question. Um, I guess yoga, the, the, the fundamental uh, sort of principle of yoga is Hatha yoga. That's, that's the root of it. That's how it started. Hatha yoga it encompasses philosophy and movement and meditation uh, and then that all you know together put put together means you know you're aiming for a spiritual existence um, then of course as time went on so yoga dates back to 5,000 years ago it's an ancient Indian tradition uh, but as of the last sort of 30 years 40 years it's branched off in, branched off into various practices so vinyasa is specifically dynamic movement with the breath incorporated so you marry the breath and the movement together it's a bit more fast paced uh, and it is to kind of go through a bit of a flow uh, and it can be challenging you know i find it quite challenging if you go to a vinyasa class you will be uh, out of breath you will get sweaty uh, but it's um yeah it's a fantastic and energizing practice um, have the yoga in itself in terms of the postures they're more static so you do one pose after the other you have more time to sort of explore each posture and of course you incorporate breath work into it yin yoga is um, although it's been practiced for for many many years more recently it's come to the surface and uh, I think more because people are experiencing a lot of stress and yin yoga is an extremely slow practice. So for example, an hour's class could possibly consist of just four poses that you would hold for a prolonged period of time, anywhere from sort of three minutes upwards to 15 minutes. It's not easy uh, because it does start to tap into the layers of tension that are held in the body, in the fascia across the body. And so it can be quite hard to sustain these poses, but through practicing yin yoga in particular, uh, you tap into this essence of undoing and being rather than an action based mm. approach um, and it just helps remove tension from the body so that's yin yoga um, moving on to the difference between yoga and meditation like I said yoga hatha yoga uh, is is the fundamental basis for all of yoga so every mm. other aspect of yoga comes from hatha yoga itself um, and Hatha Yoga uh, includes movement, um, so postures that you practice, breath work, breath control. Uh, it includes philosophy, spirituality, uh, ethics, uh, a way of living. It also addresses diet and also it uh, includes meditation. Um, so meditation is included as part of yoga. Uh, but meditation in itself focuses on relaxation and concentration. So dealing with the scope of awareness and attention. Mm. And then, of course, you can branch off from meditation into sort of more modern meditation uh, that removes the spirituality aspect of it and moves into sort of the realm of mindfulness. Uh, and you also have Buddhist meditation, 
Um, so that's, yeah, I hope that's <laughs> giving you an insight into In a nutshell. <laughs> in a nutshell, we could go on, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, now, Kay's in the background um, answering any questions in the chat box that she can. If there are questions that remain unanswered, whether it's from today or from any of the previous webinars, um, and you feel like they've not been answered, we, are, we do have an expert panel um, that may be able to answer those at the end of the month. Also, you're absolutely welcome to email in to us and we may be able to answer those for you sooner. So important question to kick off with, um, do you have clients that are fed back that they have improved bubble health through yoga and meditation? Absolutely, absolutely, uh, without a shadow of a doubt. Um, and it's really, it, it's really heartwarming to hear uh, how, how clients and students have been able to find a safe way to explore movement. Um, yoga is incredibly flexible and adaptable to your circumstances. And I think that's what, um, you know, initially encourages people to try it in the first place. Um, and then of course, giving that space to explore movement uh, and breath work, it, it has an incredible effect. I can safely say that I have never uh, in all my time of practicing and teaching, I've been teaching for three and a half years now, I've been practicing for 15 years, I have never um, experienced somebody have an, you know, a negative outcome as a result of a yoga meditation practice. Of course, there can be injuries that happen as a result of pushing yourself too much. And that's why it's important to find a teacher who understands your circumstances and then of course provides you a safe space and practice um, but yeah, absolutely. Of course, each person, it's, it's different for each yeah. one, you know, in terms of how much time it takes to experience benefits and healing and the level of uh, benefits that they experience. But mm. so yes, without a shadow of a doubt. Good, good. Um, and safety is a factor. I noticed there's a number of questions on safety. Are there particular yoga poses that should be avoided if you have vulval pain? So there's a fear there that might increase pain or increase tension. So this is, I mean, this is a subjective question, really. Mm. Ultimately, if somebody's got any concern with any part of their body, they need to seek uh, professional medical advice. In this case, for, for vulval pain, you would either speak to your specialist or physiotherapist and be given the go ahead to practice yoga. You'd then also need to talk to your teacher. Um, and of course, if you wish to share your circumstances so that they can understand. Uh, I personally really need to know who I'm working with uh, so that I don't offer something that's too much for them or not enough. In terms of specific poses, and this is so interesting because there isn't any particular pose that one should avoid. Maybe in the beginning, you wouldn't do poses that would uh, bear a lot of pressure in the pelvic and hip region. Uh, you would do things that were more supported and as you build up more strength or release more tension, two different things, maybe both necessary. Um, then you can gradually build up. But I, I genuinely believe that there isn't any one particular pose that you, you should avoid, um, but you should be you know, in a safe space and gradually build up the strength and the flexibility to then move on to different poses that you may not have been able to access before. So that's quite important. Yeah, there's a gradual yeah. progression. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, a general question here on how can yoga, breathwork, meditation, how can it help with pain or that sensation of pain? So uh, your webinar last week was absolutely incredible. So thank you uh, for sharing that information. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And, you know, just to talk about this uh, notion of pain, you know, all of it is real. Pain is real. It's not imaginary. Uh, but it is something that we can consciously address. Um, and <clears throat> I find that, of course, if uh, poses are painful, no matter who you are and uh, what concerns you have, 
you need to back away from that pose you know even if you don't have any concerns or any sort of niggles that you're dealing with you if you feel any pain in any posture that's something to avoid um but generally overall yoga strengthens the body mm-hmm. it strengthens your ability to kind of consciously uh, apply uh, a really positive mindset to how you move it also strengthens your ability to breathe your lung capacity mm-hmm. and that has a direct effect on the brain and and how the brain deals with uh, pain and discomfort mm-hmm. and so um over time it does take time it's not there are some immediate effects that you know i'm sure hopefully at the end we'll do a guided meditation and it'll be interesting to notice how you feel at the end of that meditation so you can quickly enter a sense of relaxation and comfort but ultimately yoga will work to strengthen the body strengthen the muscles Mm. blood flow it increases blood flow around the body and blood flow uh is regenerative it's healing in the body for the cells and the tissues yeah. and so over time uh you you will experience uh, a decrease in pain sensations okay good um so we've talked about vulval pain there's a question here um can yoga help with pure purely neuropathic pain so there's no um apparent muscular problem present so yoga, yoga deals with sort of, uh, it addresses the structural, but it also deals with the sort of uh, neurological uh, and emotional and energetic side of things as well. Predominantly through breath work. Um, I think one of the most important things, particularly for vulval pain and um, pelvic floor issues is that you you really work on uh, breath work and breath control. Um, so if it is a neuropathic issue that you're, you know, you're experiencing pain, but it's not a structural thing, um, breath work and meditation, it provides for interception. Okay, so this kind of, the, the sense of the internal state of the body. And so when you turn your attention inward through breath work, through meditation, you you cultivate self-awareness you cultivate a, a state of observation and so what then happens is that you move away from being in a reactive state you start to uh you know approach things a bit more objectively you start to really explore what's going on and through that there's a bit of open-mindedness that that evolved and i'm not saying that you know neuropathic pain means that there's a closed mindedness happening but there's a reaction that's taking place and through meditation through breath control and learning how to calm the mind you then create that space for you to turn your attention inward to see what's going on and then when you see what's going on you can then start to address what it is that you need uh, what's not working for you maybe what the triggers are and then of course that that helps you sort of uh, you know move about your daily affairs really mm, brilliant so we've got a number of questions on poses um <laughs> <laughs> Before we get into those, um, this question here, what would you recommend to a beginner in yoga? Excellent question. Okay, so um, there was that question. And then is there a particular type of yoga that is mm. best for Volvidinia? And I don't mean to kind of jump the gun uh, with you, uh, Sharon. But the, so the best yoga that I would recommend to start with is Hatha Yoga, because it will... Uh, it will help you learn what the postures are because they're static postures it gives you time to explore sort of your range of mobility uh, the edge at which you can go to and what feels good and what feels comfortable for you it gives you space and time to explore how you marry your breath with your movement and it's not so fast paced it's not so dynamic um, Hatha yoga also varies from class to class. So again, it's important to speak to the teacher that you're with and, you know, maybe explain your circumstances so that they can help you and provide you with a sequence uh, that would be most appropriate for you. Uh, As I touched on earlier, dynamic practices like vinyasa, which is fast paced um, and it's, uh, it's a flow 
uh, Ashtanga, which is you know a very strict set of rules. You have to do each posture until you get to a posture that you cannot do. And then you go right back to the beginning and start all over again. So it's very, very strict. It's very, very challenging. Incredible, though. It's an incredible, both are incredible practices, but they can be quite overwhelming uh, for a beginner uh, as they're quite fast paced and uh, yeah, quite entrenched in a lot of rules. Um, yeah, so Hatha Yoga is the best one to go for as a beginner, 100%. Brilliant. And in terms of um, how often you need to practice, um, and the question here is how often do you need to practice to see a reduction in painful symptoms? Now, we know that's going to be subjective, but, you know, what's, what's the rule when it comes to how often you have to practice? There's no specific set time or even moves to do. Um, it depends on your circumstances and everybody's different, of course, and I'm probably going to repeat that sentence a few times throughout the course mm -hmm. of this webinar. Ultimately, a daily practice is going to re reap the most benefits it's without a shadow of a doubt. And whether it's a five minute practice or an hour's practice every single day. But the reality is even I myself don't practice every single day. Um, for somebody who's just starting out, I would say, of course, introduce yourself to something, take your time with it, maybe once a week, once a week, hopefully half an hour to an hour. And I would look to build that up to twice a week. So it, so you can at least bookend your week, maybe at the start and then maybe at the, at the begin, uh, at the end of the week so that you've got something to start your week with and end your week with. Um, it's a really lovely routine to get into and maybe you could vary it something in the morning and something in the evening. I would say work up to twice a week, uh, 30 minutes each time or an hour each time. And then if it's, of course, if it's something that resonates with you, then, you know, I think if you really enjoy it and if you start to see the benefits, I think you'd be naturally inclined to take on more of the practice. Mm -hmm. But uh, I no way manage to practice every day, but I try to fit something in. I do meditate every day, but I don't practice yoga every day. Um, and even if it's a five minute stretch, kind of lying down on the floor and writhing around, uh, that can be a yoga session for you as well. So uh, all of it is all of it is good. Any amount of time. So, you know, I love that writhing around on the floor yeah. you know, as, a, as, a, as a pose. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a stretch it's getting the body moving so yes. are there any kind of um um and we'll go into some specific poses later but are there any best stretching poses for, for pelvic pain or poses that help stretch the pelvic floor the most what's really interesting is that um especially in this day and age we we are so we're so focused on niching and uh kind of putting things in boxes and defining things. And what, what my approach is, is that, yes, there are lots of poses that help stretch the hips and strengthen the glutes and the pelvic floor muscles and the legs. But what's really important is to recognize that there's a connectedness throughout the whole body. And that connectedness happens through fascia, uh, you know, this web of connective tissue that goes throughout the whole body and, uh, you know, I cannot deny that, you know, should you experience anything in, you know, your left ankle, that it can't possibly radiate and move and ripple into other parts of your body. You know, that may radiate up to your knee and to your hip and so forth and so on. As we know, um, issues with sort of pelvic floor muscles and vulvodynia can result in issues with the hip flexors, issues with the glutes, back pain, discomfort. And so really, there are so many poses that you can do. There are, and I will get to the specific poses that um, uh, you know that I've um, thought about uh, and wish to include. But generally, I would say movement. So, for example, writhing around on the floor. If you're lying on your back, uh, hopefully on a mat. If you have one, if not, your carpet will be just fine. If you're reaching and stretching your arms overhead as you writhe over the it writhe on the floor, you're immediately starting to stretch the muscles across mm. the upper body, which then ripples into the glutes and into the hip flexors and then into the legs. So you are getting a lovely stretch across the body. Mm. Um, so there isn't any specific move that you have to focus on and think that this is gonna be the key to, to sorting uh, your discomfort and pain, but 
uh, there are some poses that will help uh, strengthen and alleviate tension, which we will get onto. So I heard you use the word strengthen, and I, I wonder, because there's this thing, isn't there, for, for some women, you know, their pelvic floor muscles are already quite tense. And how about the other way around, you know, how to relax the pelvic floor muscles? Um, there's a number of questions on that. How do you teach the down training for the pelvic floor? Absolutely. I'm so glad this question has been asked. You know, this idea of Kegels, Kegels, Kegels mm. to strengthen. I'm sure everybody's sick of hearing it. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, if there is a weakness in the pelvic area, then strengthening helps okay and it doesn't have to be kegels i mean you know that's that's quite boring there is a there is an energetic uh observation uh that resembles kegels in yoga and it is called a locking uh of the pelvic floor muscles so it is a contraction so it is actually i think i do believe that kegels derives from uh the yogic practice of locking uh the pelvic floor muscles and yes, if there's strengthening that's required, then by all means, that's a wonderful practice and there's plenty of postures that help strengthen. But when it comes to tension, when somebody's experiencing tension, uh, that sort of radiates into pain in the you know, surrounding areas, there needs to be relaxation. And the best thing for that is breathing. Mm -hmm. So deep diaphragmatic breathing and, um, you know, I can go into it now or you can you know let me know when it's appropriate to go into it but I would recommend lying down okay. placing one hand on your abdomen the other hand on the floor just for a bit of grounding and taking a nice big breath in and allowing the belly to expand and this really helps relax and elongate the pelvic floor muscles and it really does help uh, alleviate tension from that region could you um, show us that could I show you? Demo, yeah. Well, I don't know if uh, my camera will allow it. Let's have a look. I'm sitting on the floor, by the way. It's not very professional, but I guess I'm a yoga teacher after you all. Are. You're allowed. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So hopefully you can see me. Yeah. So you would lie down on the floor. You can keep your knees up. Absolutely perfect. If that feels good. You can also place some cushions underneath your knees, in between your knees. If you like, you can take your legs out straight if that feels good for you. Again, for me, it varies. Some days this feels great, other days not so much. And so I change it all the time. Okay, so just tap into how it feels. And then from here, you place one hand on the abdomen, the other hand on the ground. Uh, sometimes if you like to have both, that's fine. There's, you know, there's nothing wrong about putting both hands on. And you would take a big inhale through the nose. You'd let the belly expand. So you really want to feel the belly push up. And then you can breathe out through the mouth. And the key here is that you want to feel the breath moving through the body in two stages. You want to feel that the belly expands as you inhale. And then you feel a nice stretch across the ribs and in the chest. And then you exhale through the mouth and you feel the belly fall back down. And you just keep repeating this. You wanna inhale for at least three seconds. If you can do more, that's fantastic. And then as you blow out and exhale through the mouth, you wanna let that last for at least four to five seconds. So you want it to, your exhale should last longer than your inhalation and that's something we'll get onto uh, shortly. So essentially, it's quite simple, and you just continue this for a few moments, and hopefully you should start to feel the muscles and the hips and the pelvic region and in the lower back relax. It's an incredible way. So it really helps the diaphragmatic breathing to take place because there's no gravity or pressure in terms of having to keep your body upright to focus on the diaphragmatic breathing. The diaphragm can expand quite freely as you lie down. Yeah and that really helps to facilitate deep breathing. Lovely. And how <laughs> long would you suggest that um, someone practices that? For? <coughs> a number of minutes or a number of breaths? I would say start with five. If it's really uncomfortable, it doesn't matter if you do it for a minute. But if you do it for a minute, I promise you, you'll end up being on the floor doing it for a lot longer. So it'd be silly to suggest a minute. 
I'd say aim for five, if that feels good. Mm -hmm. Then you can do it for 10 minutes, you can do it for 15 minutes. And if you haven't fallen asleep by then, you know, you can choose to carry on. Or, um, yeah, finish. I think five minutes is a good window. Mm -hmm. And if you can go up to 10, 15 minutes, that's fantastic. Lovely. Yeah. And um, is this something, if someone wanted to do it sitting down, is it something they can do that way too? Yeah, absolutely. Same thing. You just come into it seated again on the floor if you like, or you can sit on a chair. All of it is good. The main thing is you need to be comfortable. If you're not comfortable and the body's tensing and the mind is, you know, contracting over your position, then you're not going to be able to relax the muscles to breathe fully. So just make sure that you're comfortable, even on a sofa. Again, sofas tend to kind of, you know, not provide very good posture. But if you're comfortable, you can sit back and just feel open in the upper body, one hand or both hands on the belly, whatever feels good. And the same thing, you always inhale through the nose, the belly expands, you're gonna have to, you're gonna feel the belly push against your hands. And then as you breathe out through the mouth, you're gonna feel the belly gently draw back in. But again, for some, uh, especially some of my clients who feel, because also the the pain and discomfort that they deal with i found that is quite tiring for them and so in order to kind of you know hit you know two birds with one stone you want to find that relaxation across the entire body and mind you also want to release the pelvic floor muscles so lying down is a really nice way to do it it helps the shoulders relax it helps the jaw relax but sometimes if you are sitting upright and even me when I'm sitting and meditating I can feel my shoulders tensing up so it's a lot more to focus on so if you're really not feeling up to it you can just do it lying down but seated is perfectly fine as well okay great so on to what are the top three everyday yoga exercises to release tensed pelvic muscles and I know you've got a number of slides and um, yeah. you're spoiling us I think uh, we've got more than three top three <laughs> So shall I share these? Um, yeah, let's, let's yeah. talk through them. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Them. Brilliant. So what are we seeing here? Wonderful. So doing a supported child's pose. Okay. So <clears throat> without the, the cushions and the blocks and the blankets, you, your upper body would be resting on the, on the ground entirely. But for a lot of people, that's not accessible, okay? So if you can grab a few cushions in this posture, but this is an incredible way to help stretch the lower back. So really release tension from the lumbar region of the spine. It also helps to relax the hip muscles and also to get a nice stretch in the ankles and the knees. It also helps calm the nervous system down as the, the ground, the head is, you know, close to the ground. You've got really good blood flow going to the head. And then that teamed with deep breathing uh, is a really nice restoring posture. Mm -hmm. um, so it's restoring, it restores energy, it calms the nervous system down. And it's a really beautiful stretch for the spine and it releases tension from the spine all the way from the lower spine or up to the neck. Wonderful. You know, just looking at the picture <laughs> seems calming. Talk us through the next one here. Wonderful. Okay, so this is incredible. Um, but it's one that I, and this, I'm, come, I'm talking from personal experience. I used to really push in this posture. So this is the cat cow posture and it is a, an articulation of the spine. And then that also ripples into the movement of the pelvis. Okay. So rocking the pelvis back and forth. Um, so it's a really good way to release tension from the pelvic region and from the spine and, and also for the neck. And I know there was a question about releasing tension from the neck and the jaw. So really you're, you're, you're covering all bases here, all the way from the pelvis, the hips, through the spine and into the uh, neck and the jaw. And so what you would do is you would arch the spine with the head tilting up, tailbone gently pushing up. And here, as the front side of the body opens, so I'm referring to the top picture, you would then take a breath in and then you would articulate the spine and gently push your shoulder blades up to the sky 
This then invites you to lower your head and your tailbone down. So you create an arc in, in the spine facing down. Uh, and you would exhale at this point because the front side of the body is contracting. So it's an invitation to push the air out. You would do this a few times. But really what's important is I used to really push through these postures. So as I lift my head up and tailbone up, I would really squeeze at the end. And that's not something that I recommend. Really to find that ease of moving in between the two postures. Um, so it's really, really good for uh, releasing any tension in the hips and in the pelvis and in the spine. So I highly, highly recommend this. Mm. It's low impact as well. So it shouldn't cause too much discomfort for you. Okay. And again, is there a number of times you would do this? Uh, I would say work up to five times, but you can do this 10 times. And hopefully, I mean, maybe if viewers are watching, they could make note of these poses and sort of incorporate them together. I've actually put mm. them in order of how you would do them. So you would start yeah. off with child's pose, then you would come onto your hands and your knees and you would move into this five times is great. So top and bottom consists yeah. of one round. Then you do that again another four times, which totals to five. And then you'd move on to the next posture. Lovely, okay. So let's have a look at the next posture. Wonderful. <laughs> Um, bridge pose, so, so important. It's incredible for strengthening the pelvic floor muscles, but also strengthening the glutes, the quads and the hamstrings, the abdominal muscles, which are all interconnected into the pelvis. Um, and so this is an all-rounder. As you can see in this picture, there's a, there's a block that's supporting uh, the lower back. Mm -hmm. So if somebody's finding, you know, finding it difficult to lift the hips up, they can use a block, they can use a blanket, a cushion, just to kind of help create a lift for them. And as I've suggested here, this posture can be held uh, with or without support, mm -hmm. or you can do slow lifts up and down. And so, and this posture, it hits two points. It helps strengthen, but it also helps release tension. And actually, it's quite confusing, this idea of strengthening and releasing tension, because in some cases, uh, strengthening helps release tension. So when people are experiencing tension in some areas, strengthening may help release that tension. But not in every case. It's to be explored and to be discussed with uh, your movement practitioner. But uh, so it can be held in midair uh, with or without support or you can choose to just lift up nice and gently and lower down. And the slower you move, the more delicious it's going to feel. Great. And again, number of times? Again, you can do this once and hold the posture and you can hold it for a few breaths. Again, you don't need to come to a point where you're quivering and shaking mm -hmm. and the breath is faltering. You need to be able to find a sense of steadiness and ease mm. uh, or if you're doing lifts again i would aim for a nice round number five five is a good amount to do it you can do less you can do more it just doesn't matter honestly great brilliant okay on to the next one wonderful so this is a nice stretch to help release the hip flexors. Nice stretch for the hip flexors. Mm -hmm. And then that kind of ripples into the abdominal wall, into the abdominal muscles, also the quads. But it's also uh, a nice back bend as well. If you tend to get a niggle in your lower back, um, especially when you're kind of leaning backwards, it's one to, to ease into nice and slowly. What this also does, if it's held uh, and incorporates, and when you incorporate deep breaths, it does help to release the muscles in the pelvic floor. So this is a really nice one to hold. But again, for me, being somebody who practices very regularly and who has done for a long time, I can tell you that the Sphinx pose, I have good days and bad days with it. So don't expect you to feel comfortable in it immediately especially if you haven't done it before you'll start to feel you know um, a little bit of sort of 
maybe discomfort in the shoulders and maybe in the lower back and it's just for you to ease into and out of it until you feel that you're stable until you feel that you can hold it without feeling uncomfortable and then you can start to apply the deep breathing so if you're feeling uncomfortable in this posture then you shouldn't hold it you should come out of it okay. uh, but if you feel nice and fine then it's a good uh, opportunity to do some deep breathing to release the pelvic floor muscles and then once someone has gently built up to being able to hold it and, and do that mm -hmm. deep breathing how long would you suggest they hold the pose for again five breaths and when i say five breaths one round of breathing is an inhale and an exhale that's one round mm -hmm. so if you can do five of those then that's a incredible thing and in some cases it's challenging uh, and other times it feels rather easy again it's just for you to see but if it's challenging to hold for five work your way up do three four and if it feels easy to hit five rounds of breathing then you can extend it to sort of seven eight rounds um whatever feels good really just tap in to what feels right that's i can't stress that enough you have to have to absolutely be exercising awareness as you move so that you see and feel what's good and what feels right and what doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Talk us through this one. So this is the figure four stretch. Um, and it can be used with or without a wall. The lady in this picture is using a wall, which is actually a really great way to, to offer some support. Mm. Again, I don't want anybody to think that these are basic postures. These are quite complicated postures. And again, for somebody, uh, you know, who practices regularly, I have good days and bad days with this one. And um, I can struggle with, uh, with doing this one. And actually, I, I don't usually practice with the wall, but I'm certainly going to incorporate the wall into the stretch um, when I can. So it stretches the iliotibial band and the piriformis predominantly in this, uh, in this area. And the piriformis is uh, one of the muscles in the pelvic area, in the part of the pelvic floor muscles. Um, I would say that it's one to be taken uh, slowly. Uh, you really, it will vary how much of a stretch you will feel in this one. Um, so it's one to be approached very slowly. You could start with both legs and feet on the wall, and then you would take one foot and take the ankle and cross it over the thigh. Then that leg that remains on the wall would then gradually slide, the foot would slide down, creating a bend in the leg, and that will then start to really work into the stretch of the piriformis and the IT band. Again, you can hold this for as long as you like, if it feels uncomfortable, it's an indication your body's telling you to come out of it. Mm -hmm. If it's feeling good, then you can explore for up to five breaths if you wish. Repeat on both sides, of course. Yep. Brilliant. Okay, and then the final pose that you wanted to share is this one here. Yes. So there's not an official term for this one, legs up the wall. There is in yoga, it's called Viparita Karani. Um, <clears throat> so this picture here is showing a supported version of legs up the wall, uh, but you can also do it without a cushion underneath you so that your whole uh, upper body and spine are flush with the ground. You can hold this for as long as you like. This posture is incredible for so many things. So just off the top of my head, it helps with digestion. It helps with uh, uh, so it helps cool the body temperature. So if you're having a particularly hot day, so if you're in a hot climate or if, um, you know, women who are experiencing hot flushes um, or just generally not feeling well, got a temperature, this is a really nice way to cool the body down. Um, it also helps lymphatic uh, drainage. So it helps the body uh, it's a lymphatic system to move because the lymphatic system is moving upward uh, and the lymphatic system is directly linked to immune system so this helps uh, give the lymphatic system a bit of a um, you know aiding in moving 
uh, along the body, up along the body, uh, but also incredible for releasing tension from the spine, the hips and the pelvis and the glutes. Uh, really just takes the pressure off that region of the body mm -hmm. um, and is wonderful for uh, calming the nervous system down. And you can also incorporate the deep breathing that I showed you with the legs up the wall. Mm -hmm. Wonderful for uh, alleviating tension in the body and mind. Um, mm -hmm. But yes, I would recommend holding for five minutes if you can, 10 minutes even better as long as that okay <laughs> yes and and uh, as a little caveat as as lovely and relaxing as it looks holding for 10 minutes is quite a challenge um so it's very normal for you to feel quivering in the legs as the blood rushes down uh and the muscles in the legs uh start to um <laughs> ask you what's going on really because they're not used to being held in this mm. position uh but yeah over time you get used to it mm. but five minutes ten minutes incredible also if you stand on your feet a lot throughout the day mm. you know, this is an incredible posture to do again one to gently build up to absolutely yeah. again if you do it for a minute to two minutes you're going to feel the benefits of it right away mm. if you can build up longer then even better mm. brilliant Okay, so um, on to some more of the questions. Um, I prefer Pilates to yoga. Um, mm -hmm. Is Pilates good for vulval pain? Is it a good alternative? Or would you say that yoga is better? Ah, not <laughs> at all. So I think they're both wonderful. Pilates and yoga, absolutely incredible. Uh, so as I said in the beginning, yoga is uh, an ancient Indian tradition. It's been around for 5,000 years. Uh, so you can say that it's done a lot of groundwork. Uh, Pilates, I think originated in the 70s or 80s. I can't be sure, so you have to forgive me. And it comes from Germany. Uh, it was created by Joseph Pilates. And it, Pilates is a systematic approach to targeting muscular regions to strengthen the body. And then of course, to alleviate tension. I guess the, and a, the fundamental difference between yoga and Pilates is that yoga addresses philosophy, uh, spirituality and ethics, whereas Pilates doesn't. So yeah. if you find that the philosoph philosophical aspect and the spiritual aspect of yoga doesn't resonate with you, which is perfectly fine, then perhaps you'd like to try Pilates. Um, you know, many people say to me, and I think Kay was saying uh, just before we started, that all the postures that you see in Pilates are just yoga postures, which is true. <laughs> you do cover uh, a lot of yoga postures in Pilates, um, and so you wouldn't be missing out as such, uh, but it just kind of removes the philosophical side of things when you are doing Pilates. And another thing to note is that if you do go to a Pilates class, they may not um they may not make way for a gentler mindful approach they tend to be quite dynamic and challenging the classes they're incredible and they're wonderful for building strength but you if you are going to do pilates it's important to speak to the instructor uh and just let them know what your circumstances are so that they can uh, be mindful of what they offer you in the class um, so yeah, as you would need to with anyone really, with any practice. Um, we've got a, a great set of questions here about calming the mind during meditation or yoga. So any tips for blocking out negative thinking or the chattering <laughs> mind? Uh, you know what, honestly, this is the bit that I struggled with the most because I think one of the things that yoga meditation has helped me realize and regular practitioners realize particularly my students and the people that i work with is that the goal is not to block out negative thinking mm. and i think the more that we kind of focus on this idea that we need to block negative thinking out the more difficult it becomes the more we tense the more we, we stress mm. the 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 practice of meditation is to put you in a state of observation and when you when you come into a state of observation you aren't reacting anymore 
And so should negative thoughts arise, then your reaction to them isn't as strong, isn't as moving because you're using your breath, you're using the opportunity for stillness to, to see these thoughts come up uh, and you're aware of them. Meditation also focuses on the scope of uh, peripheral awareness and then moving that peripheral awareness into attention. And there are so many different practices that you can use that kind of moves you away from this clutter that goes on in our minds um, with, with all these thoughts. But I would like to highlight that, you know, if you're, if you're capable of negative thinking, then be rest assured that you're also capable of positive thinking. Mm -hmm. And so both are taking place. Uh, it's just which ones that we are we're, we're giving more focus to and meditation helps remove the focus away from these thoughts and uh, refocus your attention uh, to something else such as the breath and the sensation of the breath mm -hmm. so once you embark on a meditation practice you start to realize that actually these thoughts are going to come and go in all of us me included uh, but it's how we react to them and how we choose to react to them that is the key. And meditation helps us deal with that part. Mm, lovely. Is there a, a best position to meditate, to practice meditation? Great question. Great question. And I, uh, you, you touched on this last week in your webinar um, uh, about, you know, there was a question about being seated and how that's painful um and then meditating and this suggestion of not lying down because you'd fall asleep and i totally agree with you if you are meditating and lying down uh it's likely that you'll fall asleep but i'm going to come on to something that's so interesting in a moment the best position for meditation is to be seated how you're seated doesn't matter okay um you could be seated on the floor if that feels good your legs can be crossed or out in front of you straight out or you can widen your feet apart so that you know you have openness in the hips and then the in the hamstrings um you can sit on a sofa you can sit in a chair whatever feels good the most important thing about your position in meditation is that you're comfortable that is that is the most important thing you have to be comfortable if you're not comfortable you're not going to be able to meditate so if, if you take anything away about meditation, that is, that is the most important thing that I would like people to take away. Um, I would say that uh, you can, you know, start with as little as two to five minutes, sitting down, see how you feel. If you are observing how your body feels as you sit to meditate, that is meditation. So if you spend the entire two minutes or five minutes focusing on how the body feels oh that's a bit uncomfortable oh that doesn't feel too great let me just adjust you are meditating um so finding your position actually can be a meditative practice uh, but i wouldn't recommend lying down but sharon if we've got time i'm just going to quickly talk about a practice of meditation that is lying down that okay. i think especially for people i've had a few clients that struggle to stay seated uh, and that results in frustration and so they can't possibly explore meditation mm. uh, you know a bar a minute or two and so what I've recommended to these particular clients is yoga nidra uh, I don't know whether some of you have heard of it uh, some of you may not have it is a, it translates to yoga of sleep okay and what yoga nidra is and I highly recommend it I absolutely adore it um so you don't need to have uh you know any uh profound issues to practice it but should there be any concerns that anyone is dealing with be it sort of psychological or physical it's an incredible healing practice so it consists of you lying down and then you're given a guided meditation which usually consists of a body scan and this uh, is officially termed as a rotation of consciousness so they're moving your scope of attention from different parts of your body and then as you go into that practice which is basically you lying down and being guided 
you then enter uh, the delta state, which is the, the state that you enter as you first start your sleep. And when you enter that state, uh, it's absolutely incredible what happens. There's a deep healing effect in the mind and in the body uh, that takes place. Um, I could go on about it for hours on end. Uh, I highly, highly recommend that if you struggle to sit down, if you are experiencing a lot of discomfort and pain in the body, mm. that Yoga Nidra, spelt N-I-D-R-A, Yoga Nidra, that you look into it, you can message me about it, ask me anything you'd like about it. Um, I do offer sessions for my private clients. Um, and so if you are interested, uh, I'd be happy to try and craft one for VPS. It'd be wonderful. Uh, and you can also find it on YouTube as well. So Guided Meditations Yoga Nidra. Um, I definitely recommend uh, you to look into that if that's something that you feel would, uh, would help with pain and discomfort, because it really does. Lovely. Thank you. Um, so there's a question here. What tips do you have for making meditation a habit? I find it hard to make time and I don't always want to do it before bedtime. Yes. Great question. <laughs> I would say and the reason why I'm laughing is because everybody struggles with this even I struggle with this so <clears throat> I would say that the best thing to do the way to approach your meditation is to take the pressure off start small a minute to two minutes mm. come with no expectations and I've written here, be kind to yourself. I don't know why I've written it because I, I repeat those words at the beginning of all my meditations. Mm. Come with no expectations, be kind to yourself. So really, if you are putting the pressure on yourself to meditate, you're, you're negating the, 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 the notion and the essence of meditation, which is to simply be. So you could meditate while you put the kettle on. Mm. You could meditate while you step outside of your front door. Yeah. You could, I don't recommend it while driving. That's one thing I would say. <laughs> you could meditate any given point in the day. Mm. And all it will consist of is you just listening to the sound of your breath, mm. feeling the sensation of your breath. And by way of doing that, using your breath as a vehicle to guide you into stillness. Mm. And if that lasts a minute, beautiful. If that lasts 30 minutes, even better. It doesn't matter. You will gradually build it up. Some days, I did my meditation this morning, and usually I do half an hour to 45 minutes. And today, by 15, 20 minutes, I was feeling really agitated. And so I sat with that for a moment, and I made the decision, shall I carry on? Shall I push and force myself to reach 30-minute mark? And I said, no. And I ended it. And that was good. So just whatever feels good, try to incorporate it. The more you incorporate it in the middle of your day as you're doing something, you know, if you're sitting with a loved one, a pet, before you turn on the TV, turning on the kettle, before you start to cook, anything at all. If you just give yourself a minute to tune into the breath, mm -hmm. that will encourage you to make more time for it. And that's how people come into meditation when you start to feel, make more time for it, you start to feel better. And then you're thinking, you know what, actually, when I wake up, I'm going to sit down for a few moments. If you want a kind of specific recommendation, I would say that beginning of your day is the best time to do it because the mind is, you know, uncluttered by the experience of the day. And so it's a lot harder to meditate in the evening, I would say, just from experience and from feedback I've had. Mm -hmm. evening you've you know the day has made its impression on you things have happened conversations have taken place and so the mind is busy with all of that trying to process uh all of that so start of the day is usually a better time so maybe when you go to make your first beverage for the day is a good time or maybe when you roll out of bed okay. all right 
So I'm mindful of the time and I've seen this question, oh, wow. how, how long does it take to calm the nervous system using meditation? And this sounds like a perfect opportunity for, for you to guide us through <laughs> a meditative practice. How does that sound? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm, I, I would love to do a quick meditation. Um, just the, in response to that, it depends on each individual, okay? So it can be done in a matter of minutes with breath work, okay? Um, but meditation, as you know, I've expressed, is a long process, okay? You're going to have good days and bad days with it. So generally, as a sustained sense of well-being throughout life, that takes a while. OK, uh, and it's not always linear. It's going to have its fluctuations. We are going to have days where we feel bad. But meditation in itself gives you that grounding and anchoring for you to be in a state of observation than in a state of reaction. And so when the days are more difficult, when the days do unfold in a bad way, you are able to recognize how you're reacting to it and better control your response to these things so meditation helps that it heightens your your sense of observation and your self-awareness but breath work in a matter of minutes it can uh, absolutely help calm the nervous system down so shall we that's a good segue into a, yes, into a guided meditation yes. any safety precautions um so certainly don't do this if you're driving a car um <laughs> any other safety precautions before we you guide us uh no i would say that um no no there's no other safety precautions as long as you're not you know at the edge of a very tall building or driving a car i would say that you could do this seated comfortably as i've explained or you're welcome to do this lying down because it's a very short meditation okay lovely all right wonderful so let's get comfortable hopefully you're already comfortable so whether that's seated whether you're lying down and i just want you if you feel safe and if you feel comfortable to do this to close your eyes if not just cast your eyes down in front of you make sure that you're not straining the eyes or the gaze but the gaze is lowered or the eyes are closed and i want you to just take a moment to notice the sounds around you whatever you can hear, anything at all. And I'm gonna invite you to uh, play with the idea that any sound is perfect and it's okay. Let the sounds come as they are. Just take a moment, notice what you can hear. From here, I'm going to move the awareness to what you can feel in the body. Any sensations that come up, anything that you notice in the body or on the body. We often tend to hone in on any tension or any negative sensations that arise, but see if you can notice the sensations that feel good, such as the air against your skin, the support of the surface beneath you, whether that's the chair or the ground, the floor, and the way that your muscles are supported. Perhaps the way that the muscles can relax as you take a moment here to come into observation. And even if the awareness moves to any tension or any niggling sensations, just see if you can observe them, let them come, let them be and let them go. It's okay that these sensations come up. What's important is that you 
observe them. See if they change, how they move. From here, move your attention to the way that your body moves in response to the breath as it comes in and out without changing the way you breathe. Notice the ripples of movement across the body. Perhaps the subtle movement through the shoulders, the chest, the swelling of the abdomen as the breath comes in, and the softening of the body as the breath goes out. Just allow yourself to be with this subtle yet persistent movement. See if you can tap into the strength of it and the softness of it all at the same time. From here, I want you to notice the breath as it moves past your nostrils, into the airways, into the lungs and back out. Notice the sensation of the breath as it hits your skin. And as it moves its way back out into the open air. Perhaps you notice the inhale, the breath in is cooling and energizing. And that the breath out, the exhale is warm and softening. From here, I want you to take a nice breath in through the nose and then gently blow out through the mouth. Take another breath in through the nose for three seconds. One, two, three. Blow out through the mouth for four. One, two, three, four. Inhale through the nose. One, two, three. Exhale through the mouth. One, two, three, four. Inhale through the nose. One, two, three. Blowing out through the mouth. One, two, three, four. Inhale through the nose. One, two, three. Blow out through the mouth, one, two, three, four. Return to your normal breathing. If your eyes are closed, you can gently open them. If your eyes are downcast, gently raise them and just take a moment to observe how you're feeling. Thank you. <laughs> It's as simple as that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I hope our, our viewers uh, are sufficiently calmer and more relaxed <laughs> and still with us and not falling asleep. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you so much for joining us. I know we had um, a whole load of other questions as well that came in. Um, and uh, is it all right if I pop your contact details up on the screen so that people could contact you directly if they wish to? 
absolutely yeah yeah okay so i'm gonna do that um there we go um how are we pronouncing this it's a uh, ujjayi yoga london and um ujjayi is sanskrit for victorious and so essentially just uh, achieving victory over our challenges in life uh, and that's why i i was drawn to to using that that, that name really uh, but my mobile number is there my email is there you can find me on social media and honestly any questions at all about yoga you're welcome to ask me contact me anytime wonderful and I think at this time you're also offering online yoga classes. Am I right in thinking that? Yes, that's correct. So I'm, I'm teaching three times a week at the moment. All the details are on my website and my social media pages. Um, and they are free. They are on Zoom. Uh, so you'd be absolutely welcome to join. Anyone is welcome. <clears throat> and um, it is Hatha, Hatha Flow. So there are some flow movements going on. Uh, but uh, none of which that you uh, should be worried about because I encourage you to only do what you can to listen to your body and of course we have the added bonus of being able to practice from the safety of our own home so you can really take it easy uh, but yeah anybody's Brilliant. welcome to join those just they need to get in touch with me so that I can register them lovely okay thank you so much for your time Armina thank um, you and really, thank you to all the speakers we've had up until now. I, everyone's giving up their time for free. Um, and whilst everyone's giving up their time for free, you know, we still obviously have to fund the software and the security. We are editing these videos um, and we're going to be putting them up on, a, on our new refreshed website soon. So thank you so much for donations that have been coming in. and. Um, any small amount um you know absolutely goes a, a long way uh, for us um you'll find a donation link uh, pops up after today's webinar and also at the bottom of the screen um uh, in the uh, replay itself so by the end of the month we've got an expert panel before i tell you what's coming up next week and uh, next week's speaker i've got a question for um those of you who are on the call there's 34 of you and you may be deciding for other people we may put um, things out in social media but um, we want to know what topic you might prefer we cover in future and we've got a, a couple of um, options here um, so you might be able to see the poll on the screen so the options are psychosexual counseling sex therapy um, or uh, talking about the menopausal vagina, um, uh, including uh, vaginal atrophy. So we're just going to allow that poll to run. Now, if it is a, a split, <laughs> of course, we'll cover both at some point. Um, but if it's leading in one direction more than the other, um, then we'll probably do that one sooner. So we're just going to allow people to vote in that. It's looking very close. <laughs> I think there's a few undecided there it's it's pretty even i think so 57 percent um have gone for psychosexual counseling sex therapy 43 percent for menopausal vagina including uh, vaginal atrophy we'll cover both um at some point um and we'll probably put a few things out on social media to see whether it will be psychosexual counseling sex therapy that we cover before uh, menopausal vagina so thank you for that so next week uh, we have the absolutely brilliant dr winston de mello who's a consultant in pain medicine um, and anesthesia um, he has a pain rehab team at manchester university nhs foundation trust uh, he is very, very experienced. He's got a particular interest in um, vulval pain. Absolutely do, you know, come and, and watch that one and put your questions to him. He's, his knowledge is invaluable. Um, the link to register for that will be in the replay video from today, which you'll receive hopefully tomorrow. And all that remains for me to say is thank you, Armina, for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure.
thank you wonderful and thank you to all of you for joining us um, thank you and see you next time bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.